Hi, Leo. Hi, Anita. Um, Hi. I, it, I'm so pleased to have you both in this conversation as my um, co-conspirators in this world of, um, of mental health nonprofits in games. Um, so first, I want to start uh, by reintroducing myself. I'm the executive director of Take This, who are a mental health nonprofit that serves the game industry. And we address mental health issues across um, the industry, among people who make games, among people who play games, and in-game communities, and creator communities, and streaming communities. And so um, with that in mind, I want to uh, give uh, Leo and Anita the opportunity to introduce themselves as well, um, and their roles, and then uh, we'll go into a conversation about what we do and why we do it. So Leo, why don't you get started? Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, well, my name's Leo, and I have two jobs. My day job is the MD of Wide Production, digital publisher. My second day job is the um, chair and co-founder of Safe in Our World, which is um, like um, Take This. Uh, we're sister companies, we're sister charities. Um, we focus on the video games industry and trying to help. So we started about a year ago, um, and yeah, we've been pushing on since. So our focus is video games. So this is this is a good. And we're not for profit, obviously. So that's why I'm on this channel, on this channel. Thanks, Leo. Hi. So I'm going to give a long-winded introduction because I think it's relevant to this panel. Yeah. Um, so I am the executive director of Feminist Frequency. We are most known for um, doing feminist media criticism and uh, and. With that, uh, our, our series, Tropes Versus Women in Video Games, which broke down the way that women are represented in gaming throughout history, um, you know, to kind of show how not great it's been. <laughs> um, because of that, I have dealt with ongoing abuse and harassment from gaming communities, from um, folks online, and a lot of toxicity. That led me down a path of um, doing a lot of advocacy work around online harassment in general, both within gaming communities and at, more at large, since uh, online harassment is not uh, unique to games, it just happens a lot <laughs> in this space. So with that, Feminist Frequency has been transitioning into working on building anti-abuse initiatives to try to end abuse in the games industry and try to support folks in this space to create a more welcoming, inclusive environment. Um, with that, the first project that we have launched in that series of projects is the Games and Online Harassment Hotline, which is a emotional support, text-based, confidential emotional support hotline <laughs> for people who make and play games. Um, it is currently only in the US, um, but you can find out more at gameshotline.org. Thanks, Anita. Thank you. So Anita, you actually kind of answered the first question I had for, for both of you, which is why are you doing this, right? You come to this really quite out of your own personal experience and, um, and the recognition of what that, the impact of that can, can be. Um, and I want to also reflect that, you know, I've started to work fairly closely with you because um, that experience of harassment and abuse in the industry and online across um, games is something that continues to rise to the top as a mental health concern across the industry. And so I am compelled to, to address it also from a mental health perspective. And Leo, I wonder um, what brought you, what made, what motivated you to start Safe in, your, in Our World and what, what brought you to this issue? Okay, uh, the long version or the short, the short version? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I mean, we, we, about three years ago, we started working um, with a developer called LKA. They made a game, were making a game called The Town of Black, and it was um, based in a, on, on a real um, asylum in Italy in Volterra. Um, that existed um, from the early sort of 1900s until the late 80s. Um, we started working on it. Um, we started talking to doctors. We, we visited the place. We saw the ruins. Um, and, you know, we got heavily involved in the subject matter. It drew us in. Um, in a kind of parallel sort of, in sort of fatey sort of way, um, this particular hospital, because of where it was, um, my cousin has paranoid schizophrenia and he's kind of, one of the uncurables, sadly. Um, and he would have been at this um, hospital had he had the hospital still been around. So kind of when walking around in this place, <clears throat> it kind of hit home, um, sort of what could have been for him in particular. Um, so yeah, so we got talk talking um, 
And then I guess in 2017, because it's kind of going back three years, um, it was a pretty bad year. Um, someone very close to me tried to kill themselves and I had to literally had to pick them up and take them to the hospital. Um, one of the guys um, who works and was part of Safe for Our World, or is part of Safe for Our World, his uncle killed himself. Um, my uncle then later in the year killed himself. Um, one of my friends got sectioned. So it was a pretty bad year. I'd say 2017 was what we call Annus Horribilis, as Queen Elizabeth would say. So, um, yeah, so I was talking, and as a team, um, like-minded bunch of people at Act Wired, the company we're at, um, ranging from Neil, Aaron, Kim, I've got to mention these because they're, they're fundamental to this, Alastair, Jeannie in, in, in the US, um, and Gareth, we, we started talking about what we could do. And... We can't really um, save the world, um, but we are video games people. And um, we, so we put our heads together and said, look, we, you know, let's try and help the industry that we're in. You know, we've been in it long enough. Um, everyone that's involved is deeply personal, has deep sort of connections to the subject matter. Um, and it also kind of unlocked lots of memories for a lot of people, myself in, in, as well. Um, I think memory suppression is a thing, apparently. Um, and when you start looking back in your life and, and the early days, or maybe not necessarily that early, but just throughout your life, you realise that, um, you know, mental health has been an issue or is an issue for a lot of people, and whether you overcome it in certain ways. However, you, you know, I have, a, I have a piece on the Safe in Our World website for those who are interested on how I failed miserably, but I'm kind of still here, so it's all good. Um, and we realised that it was something we had to do. So we started to come up with ideas, um, you know, we wanted to obviously destigmatize um, the, the, the topic because people just need to talk about things and try to offer help. So we, you know, created this wonderful website with lots of resources, um, which we've implemented a whole bunch of programs for companies to try and join and sort of implement workplace guidelines. Um, we're just trying to get people to and raise awareness. Now, raising awareness isn't necessarily that, that useful, and, but we need to offer a lot of help along the way. So that's kind of a semi-long, semi-short version. So that was a great says, version. Some deeply personal subject matter. Yeah, it is super personal. And I think um, what, what uh, coming especially out of the, the previous two sessions, which were quite personal conversations about you know, the experience of having depression and, and being and trying to function in games um, with that experience is that, um, you know, these, we do this, we do this because we care about people and we care about the experience they have and their ability to function and do the work and, and, and enjoy the things that they care about, right? Um, but we are also trying to solve kind of structural issues and that's kind of that's why we create institutions that try to address that. And so um, I have a very specific approach and think and way of thinking about um, the kind of the structural systems change stuff that I want to have happen in games to address these. Um, where do you where is your perspective on you know this the support for individuals and the very important conversations that we have at a granular you know individual level? versus this larger kind of how do we change the culture and the, the assumptions that we have? Good question. <clears throat> um, sorry, my computer's talking to me. Um, to be honest, it's, it's a good point. And to, to, we wanted to reach gamers and share, you know, signposts and let people know this support. But fundamentally, we need to change company culture. Um, and so, I mean, to try and get people thinking about mental health, a lot, a lot of companies don't want to talk about it or think about it. Um, <laughs> yep. And, and that's a thing. And you go to different countries around the world um, without singling any of them out. Um, you know, in their world, mental health isn't an issue. They're all right, you know. And, and I've had that by a number of people who've actually said, you know, we're all right, you know. Um, but obviously, their staff aren't. So um, there has to be, I mean, there's small things we can do. We can train people within companies to, have, to be mental health first aiders. That's all sort of great um, from a sort of grassroots level we can get people talking have support externally that's all great but i think you know fundamentally you need to there needs to be a structure within each organization that they put in some workplace guidelines or they think about support networks and they're not actually that hard if you can just 
get people thinking about it and talking about it and having some resources in, in house that they can go and talk to, even just train one person in each company, you know, that, that gives them the, you know, the team, someone to go and talk to and even just train people and let people know that they're interested. So, um, it, I, it shouldn't be up to people like us. Um, but sadly it, it looks like it is, um, collectively. So, um, you know, governments and all that sort of stuff are not really doing enough. Um, so yeah, we, we, we have to get companies to think and change their company culture and, and also address things like the toxicity, toxicity, toxicity um, in the workplace, um, you know, the, the whole sort of, um, sort of female and whatever type of abuse mm-hmm. and also, um, you know, crunch, you know, stop. We're in a creative industry. We shouldn't be killing or not killing, but burning out the people that are in it. So there's a lot of things we can do, but it, it, it needs, um, you know, the, the, the CEOs or the, the HR execs to, to buy into this. And some, you know, we, 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 we're sort of chipping away like with a little little hammer. Um, and it's kind of making us, and, and obviously you guys as well, and, and, and Anita as well. And, you know, I think over time we'll get there. It's just going to take a bit of time to convince and get more and more people talking and, and get some of the big companies on board to actually really completely change their um, sort of company culture. Um, and without rambling on too much, but there are some really good benchmarks, you know, um, yep. Microsoft, you know, do an amazing job. Um, and really they are one of the, ben- I mean, they are an amazing benchmark on how to be employees. So there are some really good companies out there. We just need to make it worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there, it, it's interesting because I think there, there's company practice, but there's also, there's a lot of assumptions about the way games must be made. Right. You talk about crunch and, 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 and I, I, I talk a lot about the culture of secrecy in the industry. Um, and so, you know, the norms that we have that um, not just underlie the way companies treat people, but the way that managers and, and game designers and, and game directors think about the way that a game, pro, you know, the process through which a game is made that I think is quite harmful. Um, and so I kind of, I go, I go, you know, we take this as also trying to do training for companies and, you know, changing that, but it's not just that. It feels to me like that's, that's here. And if you go another layer down, um, there's a lot of ways in which we assume this is how things are made. And, and Anita, you know, you and I have been talking a lot about the ways in which the voices that are the very voices that are surfaced and heard um, kind of create the the root conditions for harassment and and stuff to happen online right so it feels to me like there are there are assumptions underlying even the way we think about games and the making of games that impact this yeah um can I sort of address the individual versus systemic stuff yeah, along do. with that? Yeah. Cool. Um, I, I think that uh, I, I find a lot of tension in my, my work, uh, my activism work around that exactly, because I think um, too often, especially in American and a lot of Western countries, we are very individualistic mindset. Like we have a very individualistic mindset. We are not taught as young people or through our education to understand how systems influence us and how we influence systems. Um, uh, gaming, like gamers and people who make games should understand this since uh, we all think in systems. <laughs> That's exactly how uh, we build out our creative um our creativity. But uh, it's also related to systems of oppression, right? It's related to how patriarchy um, perpetuates harmful notions about gender and gender roles, white supremacy, um, heteronormativity, uh, ableism, etc. And I think that if we can't see the systemic nature of the systems we live in, we're constantly just putting band-aids on uh, like a gushing geyser of doom, right? (laughs) And so... Yeah, you know, (laughs) the other day I was tweeting about Twitter. I was tweeting about Twitter. That's very meta. And I was like, what is the analogy I'm going for? It's like, you know, like if you put a Band-Aid on like blood gushing everywhere, like that's what it feels like sometimes when uh, social media companies are trying to, uh, anyways, I'm going off topic, but not really, but kind of. So um, I think that 
uh, it's really important that more and more folks start understanding the systemic nature of activism and of social change, right? That it is beyond just voting. It's beyond just changing your light bulbs. It's beyond um, just, you know, like um, tweeting or, or posting on social media that you support Black lives. Um, and so I say all of that to bring into the context of at the same time that we really need to have enormous cultural shifts in the way we think about mental health, in the way that we address toxicity, in the ways that we deal with online harassment, in the, the cultures of our companies and our businesses and what we expect as employees and what we expect as, as leadership. We also need to help people who are suffering right now, right? Like yeah. you, you also need to do both of that work. And so uh, I, I say this, I started talking about this in terms of my own tension because, you know, we run a hotline. We provide emotional support for folks who are in a, in an, in a heightened emotional state. Um, you text us, we talk to you and it's done. And sometimes I'm like, is that it? Is that all we do? But I always have to remind myself that like, that is enormously important, right? To just get people from this heightened state to a calmer state so that they can seek more support, so that they can take action, so that they can just sleep through the night is incredibly important. So this conference in general, just like listening to the conversations that have been happening, being able to hear folks talk about um, with incredible vulnerability, their own state and their own place, I think is, a, is, is steps towards the larger systemic structural changes that we are asking for and demanding and fighting for. I really, I really appreciate that framing, Anita, because it is, it's, you know, you, I, I have, I've done nonprofit work my entire career, right? And so I've always been in the business of helping people or trying to change. And, and so there's this part of me that's always like, oh my gosh, I have to help everybody, right? I want to, I always want to do everything for everyone. That's another story, but <laughs> <laughs> I talk about that with my therapist. Um, <laughs> but I, um, I think, you know, it can, it's exhausting to do that work without knowing that there's some other way to address um, change on a more sustainable level. And um Leo, you know, I wonder, I want to ask you, I guess, the, um, do you think that we can change culture, like this concern I have about the way, you know, the way, the assumptions we make about how games are made by changing the companies? Or is that like, is that like just trying to stem the tide also? Um. I mean, c companies are, are, are secret. I mean, making games is a secret process anyway. I mean, there, there has to be a little element of, you know, sort of um, confidentiality on things. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I don't mean to say that everything has to be out in the open. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I mean, can we change things? I think we can chip away. Um, I think Anita mentioned something which was really interesting in, in the fact that social media is... is, is um, It'd be good if we removed social media from the world because I think that's that's that's. Um... I, I didn't say that. <laughs> no, no. I heard that's what you were trying to say. Sorry. Um, no, no, but no, not social media, but just the toxic toxicity that's coming out on it. And um, yeah, um, I've lost the question. Sorry, Steve. <laughs> you have to go. Sorry. Have... No, I'm just thinking about. Um, I guess I'll let me frame this a little bit more carefully so that um, so it's more specific. The, um, you know, I talked about the, the challenges around transparency and crunch and like the cultural assumptions that and cultural norms that we have in the industry, um, you know, that we can't talk about anything ever, not that we have to, can't, I mean, it's obvious that we need to keep IP secret, we need to, you know, we need to have, um, uh, NDAs, we need the ability to, you know, maintain confidentiality and create surprises and do negotiations in private and all of those things, right? But um, we don't talk to each other as an industry. We don't share knowledge in a very particularly effective way. And we don't have ways for people who have um, worked on games that are secret to talk about their experience and promote themselves in particular. And that, that sense of secrecy bleeds into um, a lack of collegiality and also secrecy inside companies, which can be very damaging to employees. 
And so I wonder if things like that can be changed by um, working with individual companies to train them, or if there's other ways that we have to think about trying to change the industry. Um, yeah, it's a tough question. Um, it's, yeah, it is. I mean, it's a, it's, a, I think it's the thing I wrestle with all the time, but I just, I thought I'd pose it. Yeah. I mean, th 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 there are, I mean, subgroups, I mean, artists talk to other artists, coders do. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, I think because we're a, a, a little bit of a faceless industry, because if, I mean, if you look at the music or something or actors or, or, or different industries, mm. the, the, the talent or the key people are the faces in our industry you've got a name and you rarely have a, a an industry or you just have the occasional industry figure that represents that company um so the teams and generally there are lots of people anything i mean sometimes it's a one-man studio sometimes it's you know a thousand people working on a game it's hard for them to get any recognition for what they do and um i how they can actually do that. I mean, it'd be nice if there was a better way for people to get um, to talk about um, their projects. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it, people don't talk about the negative side. So they don't talk if they're getting harassed. They don't talk about crunch. They don't talk about um, any abuse that happens. They don't talk about any bullying that's happening. And, and I think those things are things that we should be trying to get people to talk about. Um, you know, not not name and shame, which is a terrible thing to do, but there should be there should be forums, very confidential forums for people to express themselves and and you know things happen from there. But um, I don't think we should sort of sort of there shouldn't be any sort of witch hunts or that sort of stuff based on it. But um, yeah, it's it's um it's a it's a tough one to get people talking. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, can I yeah, back on that, Eve? Yeah, I was going to say. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Do, do you want to? Okay. Go ahead. Um, I, I think that uh, there's a couple of things. One is that it took a really long time for our industry to even acknowledge abuse and acknowledge harassment. So when I, when I was first harassed by gaming communities in um, 2012, which was not the first time I was harassed online, I was told it wasn't real, um, that I was just making it up, that I should just go offline. The industry didn't really give a shit about it. I'm sorry, I don't know if I can swear. Um, I just did, it's what it is, it is, what it is. Um, that it wasn't taken seriously. And harassment, especially of marginalized folks online was not taken seriously. So people were afraid to speak up. In that same year, at the end of 2012, there was the hashtag number one reason why. And it was started by women in the industry to talk about the fact that harassment in this industry is real. Um, and it was flooded. Like, just absolutely flooded. People were coming forward with stories that they had kept to themselves for so, so, so long. And I think that while, and as we have now seen two pretty significant kind of Me Too moments that have happened in games where people have come forward about abuse in, in their games communities, whether they're streamers, whether they work at companies, um, by powerful people exploiting their power. And so there are conversations happening around that. It's just still... Um, there's still a lot of shame and stigma attached to it. And this is in games and beyond, right? People and survivors and victims have been kind of forced to keep their mouths shut for a long time. And you see that the way that the media talks about it, you see that in the way that like our legal system deals with uh, folks who try to come forward or press charges. And also people in power do a lot to try and... Um, to try and maintain their power and silence anyone who um, might challenge that. So I, I just wanted to address the like, yes, people are speaking up about it, but that there is an enormous amount of shame. And there's also a collective um, unease and, and um, unclarity, uh, non-knowing, <laughs> I don't know what word I'm looking for, just in how to deal with it. So there are a lot of well-meaning folks in our industry who want to do the right thing, who want to support folks who are speaking up about these issues, who want to have better communities around them, that they realize their audiences for their games that are funding their games are really toxic. What do they do about that? How do they engage with it? And so I think we're at this really interesting point in the games industry where like, there's enough care there's just not enough understanding or education around what to do around that, if that makes sense. And so relating to this issue about transparency, 
Um, I think that, and, and this, this comes out of tech, right? Like tech largely is an enormously um, uh, paranoid industry <laughs> in general, right? You can't walk through the front door of any of these companies without signing your firstborn child away or what have you. Um, I think that what's important is that we're sharing tools around the issues of mental health support, right? About how do we care for our employees? How do we move away from crunch and burnout? How do we actually support people who are dealing with, um, with harassment or abuse? Like those are not, those should not be reserved for an individual company to deal with, right? We should be sharing that information and that data around to create and uplift everybody. Not create, but to uplift everybody. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think it's, a, it's about skills and also like, you know, we have, I, I appreciate where where your comment about social media um, came from. You know, this we need to like the the current design of social media uh, uh, encourages uh, outrage and extremism and attack and you know and it it doesn't uh, it does not encourage or foster um, growth and accountability and, you know, thoughtful conversation. And those are the things that you need in order to build, you know, a healthier community, right? And because so much of our community building happens online, especially right now in during the pandemic, where we can't even meet for conferences, right? That it's like we need, we don't have the right tools really quite in place to, 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 to change that, to, to hold people accountable in a positive and kind of constructive way, as opposed to a negative and uh, demeaning way. I agree. I mean, we we kind of um, talked internally on on the what company side, side, not the charity side, about how do we avoid not social media, but how can we? Because we, we're feeding the problem by by you know using it as a tool to advertise and do whatever. You know, we're actually contributing. To yeah um, and you know i think there has to be more time i'm um, just you know i think there's going to be a really um tomorrow uh there's going to be a, a great panel on community mental health and community management with some really smart community managers talking about i mean there are ways in which we can create positive and healthy communities online even given the tools we have now um, take this has done that with our discord and and there are some really fantastic communities out there and so I think you know we just we have to make it a priority to 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 do that right to be to make that process of community building and community design um, is there any knowledge and training the community managers or the people yeah. that are yeah I mean that's something, yeah that's something we do and um, I know the fair play alliance which is another organization that's emerging as a real leader in this is trying to to look at design principles and games around you know how you do that um which also brings up actually uh, one of the, the question i didn't yet ask the the two of you um but i think is kind of becoming obvious in this conversation is you know why did why why start a, a nonprofit organization why try to do this from like you know uh, as opposed to being an advocate internally why do you do it from an external, you know, entity? What is the motivation behind that? And so I think it's worth saying, you know, there's a role for, there's a specific role for an NGO or, an, or a charity or a nonprofit in games or in any industry. Um, and I'd love to articulate that a little bit. I think we all care about the industry, you know, fundamentally. And we want to try yeah. and affect some positive change. You know, I mean, there's a lot of people that think and, and talk and do little things, you know, on a micro level. But I think it's consolidating, you know, consolidating some of the actions that are happening, and you know, trying to spread it and and you know, you know, just grow the support, grow the movement. I know it's movement's not the right word, but you know, get more people talking and and, and joining in on, on on various policies. Um, you know, we we got a great industry. We just and 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 argue not argue. It's, it's the the biggest in and it's the biggest entertainment industry out of all the you know, music and film. We should be fostering, you know, better world mind mindfulness and and a better environment, you know. And we have the position we are in the position to be able to do that. You know, I, I kind of 
it's an anecdotal thing, but half the population of the world plays a game, you know, whether it's a mobile game, PC game or console game. That's 3.75 billion people. I mean, if we through whether it's through the games or whether it's messaging or whether as in sort of boot up screens or whether it's topics within games or the communities around it, we, you know, we have an ability to get whatever message we want to that gamer. So um, I think we're in a really strong position to, 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 to send some positive messages um, to gamers and the people throughout the pit the industry that, that makes these wonderful games and supports them. You know, we're in a strong position. We just need to kind of unite, I think, and, and get the right message out. I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Anita. I think that um, I'm going to just caveat this so that I don't have to come back to it, but that there are a lot of issues with the way that nonprofits are structured and the, and, and the you know, there's the whole thinking in, uh, around the nonprofit industrial complex. So I'm going to put that aside, <laughs> yeah. but I just want to acknowledge that like there are structural issues with the way that nonprofits are currently set up um, to mimic and model, uh, you know, corporate capitalism. Um, that said, uh, I think that the space of nonprofits serves a number of purposes. One is that we are outside of the belly of the beast in a lot of ways. We can serve as folks who have training in other arenas, um, who bring in a wealth of education and knowledge that folks in the games industry don't need to have, right? Like they, they don't need to be trained in having psychology backgrounds or having media criticism backgrounds or having, uh, you know, what have you. There's lots of different nonprofits that support the games industry. And so th there is a little bit of um, bringing in different kinds of expertise and bringing in different kinds of experiences that can make the industry bigger and better and flourish without putting the strain on each individual company to also have 25 different types of expertise. The other aspect is that we are independent. Um, and that kind of goes into the caveat about fundraising and all of that. But for the most part, like, I mean, we are independent entities that exist um, outside of the constraints of the industry. So for example, um, this is a very minor example, but the games hotline. You can reach out to us and it, we will never talk to your employer. <laughs> you can say whatever you want to us about your place of business, about people at your work, and you don't need to worry or risk or be concerned that it's going to get back to them. Um, that's just one reason why I think, for example, having a hotline as an independent uh, resource away from the industry, but informed by and, and culturally competent around the industry is really important. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. I mean, I think... Uh, nonprofits, um, absolutely, you know, having started my career in nonprofits as a fundraiser, like it, it has always been bare to me, you know, what are, you know, not the nonprofit sector really is kind of a bandaid on the existing system, as opposed to it, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge to, in, to undertake systemic change and like transformative change inside the nonprofit structure. That said, we do have us, we, we do sit outside and we can add, we can be advocates and change agents and also um, a form of accountability, right? A constructive form of accountability because with our, with our, um, with our perspective and our, desire to help and support, we can be a partner, right? We can be an active partner. And, and I see that as, an, as a real opportunity. Um, there are times when in my role as a nonprofit leader, I get frustrated. I get frustrated about the, the, the scope of what I can and can't do, right? And that's just tough. I do want to just add to, if I can, you're talking about like advocacy and advocating, um, that change happens through public pressure. That is often how social movements happen and how, how company change happens in terms of the large, bigger picture. And nonprofits, as well as individuals, can play that role in continuing to put pressure on companies to do better. Um, you know, the, the conversations around um, crunch and burnout and unionizing and... Um, and uh, abuse and Me Too and all of that, like those conversations can't exist in the vacuum of that company. They have to exist larger. And those conversations probably wouldn't happen if you didn't have folks um, putting pressure on them to actually be better and do better. And that can happen from employees internally, but I think it's a combination of things. So just adding to what Eve was saying about like, it's advocacy, but it's also actually activism for some groups, right? And for some people um, and sort of shepherding those, um, 
the the direction and the thinking and discussions around some of that. Yeah, I think it's interesting that we're talking about activism and, and advocacy, um, but we also all um, are trying to act to offer either practical training or skills or tools as well in some way. Um, through the work that we're doing. And, and, I, and I speak as an activist, so I'm, I right. also should just clarify that not all nonprofits are like advocacy based or aren't like activist based and that sort of thing. So I am speaking for me and, and mm -hmm. what we're doing, just, <laughs> just so nobody else feels like they're put on the spot here. Uh, no, I, I hear you. Although I think in, in some way, all of us are at least trying to be advocacy organizations. Um, Leo, you know, we, you and I both are trying to think about how do we change the way that that companies approach the way that games are made, right? Yeah, I mean, we, it's, it's um, you, you look at the, the job ahead and you have to create a strategy where, where you target different things, where you target companies, you target your gamers um, and, and try and put strategy in place. A lot, some of it is advocacy. I mean, I think the, the bigger picture, if we manage to, as, a, as, a, as an industry, um, you know, do make positive changes, the next step really um, is to approach the governments with the work that we're doing. I mean, that's 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 where. I mean, but we we're not ready. I, I don't feel that we, you know, that, but um, you know, but by, by the time we've created, uh, we'll, we'll have some examples of positive change that we've we've managed to create. Then the next step really is to show the people that should be doing this how it should be done. I mean, that'd be a great day. <laughs> you know, I, lo I love talking to your your because they're like, just get government grants and talk to the government. They'll help out with things. And I'm like, oh, that's not the way it works in America. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the, global, the global situation, obviously, every country is different. I mean, yeah, UK, we, we, it's, it's different. I mean, it's not for the right reasons, though. I mean, there are hundreds of charities in the UK, and they do more than a lot of the government. Does. They do more than the government should be doing. So it's absolutely wrong. But we, we do have a hotline. We can go to the House of Parliament and Westminster and knock on their door and, and eventually get an audience with the right people. Um, but we have to be ready, and we're not ready for that. Um, but I think if, if, we, if we do show that there are policies in place and it's positive and, and, and frame not just the company side, but just, just the wider sort of policies. You know, in the UK, the, 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 the lot I mentioned at the early stage of this whole terror asylum shut down, it kind of was a global, th well, definitely in Europe, most of the big asylums shut down. And there was not really a, a policy in place to deal with all the, the people that were, should have been genuinely should have been in an asylum. So there's lots of people out in the care, you know, so, who need support and that support is lacking, you know. So it, forget the games industry a second. There are people that with mental health issues that need help, you know. So, you know, we're focused on the game because of the reasons we see we're kind of close to this industry, but it could help other people and the government should be doing more. So without going on to a sort of government beating section, but government should be doing more. And I think eventually our goal, well, our goal, my goal more, is at least knock on a door and have a conversation or three and try and do something. So, yeah. 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 No, I, I, I think it's worth um, kind of touching on that because we, um, you know, I, we say a lot at Take This that, that, you know, everyone should try to get, um, access to therapeutic support if they need it or, or um, uh, if they want it. Um, but the truth is that the system, the, the, the mental health care system in this country is really awful. And uh, most people, a lot of people can't access it or they can't access it sufficiently or it's, um, it's too costly. Uh, and if they need more comprehensive support, if you know, going to a therapist on a regular basis isn't sufficient, uh, the, the systems in place are, are, are nearly non-existent. And if they are, they're usually inaccessible to most people. Um, and that's also, you know, that's a personal story in my family as well. You know, you see that people, if, if, if my family member didn't live in Utah, there wouldn't be support for her. Um, uh, yeah, and that's a problem. That's a real problem. Um, I just want to, uh, it's 1116 now, so I want to open this up to questions if there are um, across uh, both in Slack and in the Q&A feature here in um, Zoom. Uh, if there are any questions that all of you have for us um, over the next um, 15 minutes or so. Um, and then uh, I guess the other thing is, what do you see 
but while people are, are moving towards um, are, are submitting questions, what, what would you say are some of the, we've talked a little bit about, you know, so what are the challenges? Why do we do this work? What are some of the things that you kind of think are opportunities or are um, you think um, you're excited about in the work that you're doing? Uh, personally, I mean, we, just the um, the effect, the instant effect that you can have on, on people. I mean, we released a, a little game on behalf of the Safe and I Welcome Project in Mind, and it, it was a nice, it was a half an hour experience, video game experience, we called it. But it was, it was just made from the heart. And it, it was um, Emily Mitchell's personal journey through yeah. her yeah. anxiety, and by sharing that experience through the form of video games, um, helped. I wouldn't say hundreds of thousands of people, definitely helped the thousands of people. I mean, we had messages from people from Korea, um, Germany, from all over the world of, of thanking her for sharing her experience. So I think the instant, I mean, the ability to be able to do something have an instant effect. So, um, and also get the message out in such creative ways. You know, it's not just about preaching and teaching. You know, we can, we can be subtle, or not necessarily too subtle, but we can get messages out in a really interesting way. Um, so yeah, for me, one of the big things is, um, you know, the instant effect or the, you know, direct effect that we can have on people. Yeah. Yeah. Games are a really powerful medium. Yeah. Yeah, they certainly are. Yeah. Um, so well, the work I'm doing now is very different than any work I've done before. And so yeah. I think that there's like a excitement just in like bro broaching this new territory for myself personally. I think that um, with the launch of the hotline, which has been open for two months now, uh, seeing the way it's used has been incredibly validating. Uh, I, you know, I was personally really worried that folks would think it's just an online harassment hotline and that you could only call t or text in if it was uh, issues surrounding that. But people really understood that it is general mental health support and and have been using it as such and so seeing the range of um the range in which people are are texting into us about um that they trust the service and are using it and and we've gotten some testimonials from folks who are just like that was great like that was exactly what i needed i needed someone to talk to and you were there so thank you um means a lot um and it, reminds me that it was worth <laughs> worth doing and, and putting together. I also think that we're in a really interesting moment in uh, in games and, and broadly in entertainment industry, culturally, around talking about issues of, um, uh, around, I, I want to say about abuse and toxicity and harassment, but more broadly of like believing people's experiences when they share them. And I think that we're, we that is really exciting to me. So it's opening up this possibility space for us to really have an impact on this industry and for the industry to start um, thinking about how it wants to be structured, thinking about how it wants to care for its employees, thinking about what kinds of games um, we want to be making, about who our audi ideal audiences are. And so, you know, one of the things um, that even I have been working on is, is a training um, to try and help support leaders in the industry be better leaders and thinking about what that means holistically, right? It's not just um, hiring a diversity and inclusion officer or, or having that be unpaid labor in someone's workplace, but really what does it mean to integrate all of these, um, you know, mental health concerns, diversity, inclusion concerns, and bring, bring a space. I am, Losing my words, y'all. <laughs> We're at the end of the section. Um, but really bringing um, these issues to the forefront, which, so, so that's what I'm excited about, that these issues are becoming mainstream issues, that they're becoming headline issues, that they are on the lips of, of, of leadership in the games industry, so that we can create this space that we all, uh, we can create an inclusive space for, for everybody. Because here's the thing. The games industry has not been great to me. Um, you know, like I'm just to be frank about it, like it hasn't been a pleasant experience, but I'm still here and I'm here because it's also incredible. There's incredible communities. There's incredible creativity. There's so much that this industry has to offer. And I really am excited about the opportunity to not uh, squander that. 
um, or further and, and create more space for more people to come in and feel supported and not have to run through a gauntlet to get there. I think uh, that's really lovely, Anita. I think um, there's, games are, are, are rich and, and fascinating and exciting and the community of people. I mean, I think about, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about the previous session with, um, with um, Mike Wilson and, and Chris Turla and, and Calum Underwood talking about being part of this industry for so long and recognize, both recognizing their privilege and also recognizing um, you know, the home that they have found in this industry and, and the sense of, of belonging. And, um, you know, I think if we, if we can hold that tension of knowing that this, this space is, you know, both a fraught space where people have had a specific kind of privilege and have, um, but it's also a, a space where we are, um, can celebrate and, um, and take joy in each other's presence and in each other's, um, desire to play and, and, and create together, um, then we have, uh, we have something very special. We just have to be um, really kind of self-aware and we're in that process of discovery, that self, you know. Um, and I do, I wanna just reflect, Anita, on what you mentioned that we're, we have been working on together, this, this effort to, to develop um, leadership skills, basically, to support leaders and um, their understanding of their place and their role, their role and responsibility. Because I do think that culture change um, has to come from the top, and it has to um, it has to be something that that leaders are committed to and understand intrinsically. And that's and that's where the sense of paralysis comes from: is that people know that they need change, but they don't have the skills, they don't have the tools, and they don't have the knowledge. It's like, I know enough to know what I don't know. And that's a very tough place to be in. And so it's like, you know, we really, we have a responsibility to provide that. Um, and as, as nonprofits in this space, Aris Charities in this space, we have, um, we can serve that role. You know. Yeah, shameless plug. If you are uh, someone in the games industry that this is resonating with and you feel like you want support or um care around this, please reach out because we're working on some pretty exciting stuff and yeah. we want to, pr we want to do this for you. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, at the root, like we do this because we can be of service and, um, and we have articulated, we found a way to articulate exactly how we can be of service. Um, and in this case to the industry, you know, my, um, I, I wasn't, I didn't think of myself as a, as a, gamer for a long time, but my husband's been in this game, the industry for, you know, 15 years. And I came with lots of love and sympathy for what he did and, and delight in what he did. Right. And now, um, I consider myself a gamer and I also consider myself somebody who, who just feels very kind of, um, warmly towards what games are and what they bring to people's lives. And so, um, from that perspective, it's like, yeah, of course we want to help this this um this industry to thrive and to to grow um and i'm just i'm gonna sit back here and just um make sure that i'm not missing any questions um this is a last chance um uh to uh to submit questions, Leo or Anita, is there anything else you want to like? Do you feel that I missed in this conversation that you want to make sure that you we talk about? I think um, just as role as um, sort of charity you know, within this industry, yeah. it's also a duty to um, be spokespeople for the industry. So when the uh, WHO or whoever starts saying there's, there's gaming disorders and whatever else, and then sort of doing a, a one eighty and saying gaming is good, there should be, a, you know, we should be folks people <laughs> for this industry and highlighting all the good stuff that it does um you know and you know because of covid and you know obviously a lot of the attitude towards the industry has changed from, ex from outside of the industry um but we just need to provide i guess more stats more research more um ammunition to support um the games industry externally so i think it's it's our roles um to, to sort of collate to administer 
or, or action some research and put together a really solid case, a solid case for when people come 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 and start attacking us. You know, we've got some armory, you know, and, and even just go on the front foot on a PR campaign um, against them. So um, we've got a lot to say. We just need to kind of collate um, our ammunition, really. And it's our duty as, as sort of charity organisations, I think, to be the spokespeople. Yeah, Leo, I, 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 yeah, I really, I'm glad that you brought that up because um, there is quite a lot of stigma around games and mental health in particular. And, um, and around this, the issue of internet gaming disorder has been, it's, it's, a, it's a frustrating one to watch because the research is quite poor um, and it's moral panic. <laughs> yeah, it's moral panic. And that it's not, um, it's not fair to games. It's not pa fair to people who play games <laughs> to, 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 to talk about game addiction or internet gaming disorder in this blanket way without really understanding the nature of addiction and, and, and understanding the nature of um, the things that people come to games with already, right? The underlying conditions and, and needs that, that people have and the needs that games fulfill for them, right? And I, I just, it's funny, I just thought, um, Dr. Bruce Bowen pop up in the in the uh, panelist list, and he and Dr. B will be talking uh, tomorrow about some great, uh, the, you know, in part about this 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 issue. Um, the it's um, and and so will um, uh, Platinum Paragon and and Dr. Coart from Take This. You know the the um, as much as as you know half the world's population play games. The stigma around around the idea of the gamer and the stigma around who plays games and why they play and what it does to people uh, is pretty substantial. And yes, we do absolutely have a role to play in um, in providing an accurate, a more accurate and more thoughtful and nuanced picture to the world about what um, what games provide, both positive and negative, but largely you know, what people don't realize in terms of what's positive about games. I, I'm going to completely change topics <laughs> away from that. A uh, that like, that's it. a great ending and I'm going to ruin it. Sorry. <laughs> um, so because we're I bring it back a little bit to nonprofits, I just two things that I'm thinking about. One is I just want to acknowledge that like running nonprofits is hard and it's a labor of love and we need your support. Like we all, like all of us, we need your money. We need your support. We need your uh, help promoting things. We need uh, your resources, like nonprofits. We barely get paid anything to do this work and we're doing it to make the industry better. So help us help you. <laughs> um, and just understand that like when, when you see nonprofits around, is that like everyone is doing it because they care. You don't work at nonprofits because, you know, like it's, it is a fulfilling experience. It is not a financially, uh, uh, <laughs> like it's difficult. Nonprofit running up. Anyways, not, Give us all your money is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, let all of us, all the nonprofits. Um, the other thing I was thinking about, especially in listening to how personal the conversations before this session were, is I've been thinking a lot about what it means to be um, a manager and what it means to run an organization. Mm. And we talk a lot about what um, crunch in the games industry and mental health and how that's supported. But we need to also talk about that in our nonprofits as well. Because I think, um, I, I suspect as, as ours does, we go through crunchy periods. Um, we go through phases where people are working really hard and long hours and you know it's not like you get overtime for that because there is this sense like Eve was talking about earlier where like you can't say no or like it's really important and therefore you have to do it and so one of the things that we've been doing at Feminist Frequency is is really acknowledging what our internal values are and and centering rest has been the value for 2020 for us and that means for us it means we work four hour, four day weeks. Um, we each, uh, me and my other staff member, we each try to take one day off a week. It doesn't always work out that way, but that's important, right? Trying to take an actual lunch hour break during the day where you can reset really. And, and whether that happens or not, being able to think about rest and think about your own personal care um, is paramount to us. So, you know, if you're having a bad day or you have, um, a bit of a headache or you didn't sleep well, like 
ha- can you just take the rest of the day off? Is there anything urgent happening? Yes, no, will help make that decision. So I, wanna, I want us to think in the nonprofit world as well about what it means to care for ourselves, especially in <laughs> as we're serving and talking about mental health. We need to reflect that on ourselves as well. Yes. Thank you, Anita. I think that really, yeah, that, that strikes a major chord. And actually that's a great, um, that's a great thing to end on because, you know, the idea of, of both modeling um, and I'm seeing in, in Slack, the, the idea that the, um, the term transformational leaders, um, that's really important. And that is part of what we've been talking about. How do we create transform transformational leadership across the industry? Um, and how do we ensure that we all take care of ourselves? Um, and so um, on that note, I'm going to thank Anita and Leo for, for participating in this great conversation and for the work you're doing. Like, you know, you are great partners to the work that Take This is doing and you're great partners um, and support for the industry. And so.